everything is more expensive. Prices overall are about 13% higher than they were in April 2021, with the cost of groceries rising by nearly 20% over that time, and the cost of gas up 22%. It's even expensive to stay home. For example, the cost of electricity has surged 21%. Reducing inflation is the number one long-term objective of central banking right now. And that's true in the U.S. as well as globally. Sometimes inflation is like a shock because it destroys the consumer's real income. We look back in the early days of inflation, the Fed was using this term transitory, transitory to describe inflation because they thought a lot of the things that were causing prices to go up in the near term were related to the pandemic. They thought eventually that stuff would just dissipate. Well, it really hasn't. The Federal Reserve is using the most powerful tool it has to slow down the inflation creep, interest rate hikes. It is a very effective way. The problem is it's as much an art as a science. Different parts of the economy respond differently to changes in interest rates. One of the things that people don't understand is that inflation really might be benefiting them in ways they don't fully acknowledge. There are winners and losers. There are certainly people in the economy for whom whom this is the major challenge, and there are people in the economy for whom this is a big opportunity. So why does inflation stick around? Is anyone benefiting from it? And how do we get rid of it? Inflation is simply the rate of increase in prices in the economy. Inflation can occur for a number of reasons. One is supply and demand issues, meaning there's too much money to go around or not enough things to go around. Another catalyst, the cost of doing business increases, which leads to companies raising their prices. All of those things happened at scale in the past three years. Prices skyrocketed in a very volatile environment. But now that we're past the worst of the pandemic and stressors, prices are still struggling to stabilize. It's difficult for businesses to figure out how to set exactly the right price. When do the prices of things change? Some goods change prices frequently. If you go to the gas station, it's different every time. If you think of other things that we pay for, like college tuition or rents, or even something simple like the cost of a movie ticket, those things have lower frequency resets. So it's difficult for consumers to do their shopping. If you you put something in your shopping basket and you come back the next morning and it's a different price, you might feel not good about that and not like the firm that's doing that to you. And because of these reasons, the firms often leave their prices stable for a period of time. Inflation also has a funny component that's expectations driven, meaning if we expect prices to go up in the future, it's probably going to happen. If we think, for example, that inflation is going to stay higher for longer, I will be inclined to price that in because I only get to reset my prices once or twice a year. So I'm building in an expectation that inflation may stay higher for longer. Actually doing that may mean inflation stays higher for longer. But if I expect for prices to be stable, if I'm convinced the Federal Reserve is going to do their job and get rid of inflation and stabilize prices, well, I should stabilize my prices as well. So part of the battle that we're fighting when we fight inflation is the battle of expectations. When inflation expectations are high, it tends to influence behavior. It will make people think, well, I'm paying more for goods, so I need more money. And then in turn, business owners will say, my employers are going to come to me for raises, so therefore I need to raise prices. So you can see where this goes. It just creates kind of this vicious cycle. Economists will call it a wage price spiral, where as prices go higher, wages will go higher, and then prices will continue to go higher. And those things just start to chase each other, and it perpetuates this kind of vicious cycle of inflation that we've seen. A very strong labor market or an overheated labor market can be one factor in pushing inflation higher. There's a tension here. Workers have been steadily losing out for decades while firms are gaining more and more profit share. But the other problem is that the primary driver of inflation right now is not stuck supply chains. It's really the wage piece. A worker shortage contributed to pushing wages and prices higher. Workers have seen big pay increases since early 2021, which led to record job openings, high turnover, and the unemployment rate at historic lows. But there are signs that wage growth is cooling, with layoffs skyrocketing in 2023 across different industries. People care about inflation because of the low unemployment. The ability to change jobs for higher pay is a result of low unemployment. And so we may increase their base salaries to say, please stay. The only way to correct for overpaying on base salary is reductions in force, layoffs. It's a challenge for businesses because it's mostly coming from wages and they have to find ways to be profitable despite the rising cost of labor. 
But that's not a challenge for the workers that are getting those higher wages. So there's some people who are benefiting because they're getting paid more and they're getting paid more relative to the profits of business that have been high for a long time. Typically in inflationary periods, wages don't keep up and it's the price of goods that are going up more than the cost of labor. But this is an unusual episode where it seems like right now the main driver of inflation is actually labor costs. And what that means actually is that workers are gaining. There's a balancing act when it comes to tackling inflation because we generally don't want to stop prices from rising completely. The Fed considers an inflation rate of about 2% to be signs of a growing economy. If you have no inflation, that implies that things are just generally flat. And if you look at times through history when we've had extremely low inflation rates, it has coincided with very slow growth. The goal is to make price changes so minimal on average over time that the average household and the average firm doesn't think about it when they're making their spending and investment and hiring decisions. The primary tool is monetary policy. And here we're talking about the Federal Reserve raising short-term interest rates to slow down economic activity and slow down demand. When the Federal Reserve raises rates that quickly, it changes the impetus to borrow if you're a US consumer, and it changes the impetus to lend if you're a bank. It sort of slows nominal demand. And with the slowing of nominal demand, right, if we think about a steady state of supply, with that steady state of supply, with lower demand, brings in the generalized price level. The Fed's goal is to slow down the increase in prices, not to make prices go down below where they were originally, which economists call deflation. Deflation is pretty harmful because if prices are going down, then a lot of consumers will say, well, why do I want to buy something today that will be cheaper tomorrow? And so it's usually associated with very low demand and a recessionary state. But interest rate hikes can also lead to some pain for consumers. Sometimes slowing inflation down, reducing demand means the labor market weakens. And that could mean consumption slows, activity falls, and you do get a recession. It's not a pleasant trade-off for policymakers to run that risk of saying, well, we need to slow the economy down to bring inflation down. Yes, it means we're risking a recession, but the long-run history, here I'm talking across decades, suggests the best outcome for the U.S. economy or any other economy in general is when inflation is low and stable and we're not talking about it. So at times that does mean you have to risk a recession, but evidence suggests that's the right thing to do if it means that inflation will be low and stable over time. There's also a consumer behavior component to slowing down inflation. There is that quote, nothing like high prices cures high prices. And it's in some ways reflective of the fact that the consumer solves a lot of the problem, even without the help of the Federal Reserve or anything else on their own by restricting demand to come in line with supply. Eventually prices will hit a point where consumers will just say, okay, enough, I'm not gonna buy this good anymore. And that will result in some other things. Either consumers just won't buy anything. They'll just say, we're not gonna buy cars anymore because car prices are too high. What consumers will sometimes do then is that they'll substitute. Instead of buying those higher price goods, they'll buy lower price goods. And that in turn will help kind of pull prices down. Obviously, if your goods aren't selling, what are you gonna do? You're gonna cut prices. It's been a little over a year since the Fed first started hiking interest rates in March 2022. There are signs that economic growth is slowing, which is what the Fed thinks the economy needs. But the current rise in prices is still above the Fed's goal of 2%. The Fed uses the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, or PCE, as its inflation indicator. The year-over-year -year changes in PCE peaked in April 2021 at 30%. That number was down to around 6% year-over-year -year change in March 2023. We're looking at more normalized levels of inflation for the first time really in history without a recession. Consumers still have a lot of money. They're still able to buy things. And I think anybody who has tried to get a restaurant reservation lately can see that. Anybody who's tried to book a vacation can see that people are still out there spending money. And that, of course, is in itself inflationary. There are also global factors at play. The U.S. actually imports some inflation from the rest of the world, and that's because we import some of our goods and services that we consume. 
if you get a good that was produced in Mexico and the price of goods in Mexico is rising, well then probably that import from Mexico is more expensive here as well. And that shows up as higher goods prices in the United States. I think the big question now is, will it remain sticky? And have we seen something that's necessarily going to change the outcome over the next decade versus our prior decade? And I'd say the jury's still out on that. Markets are kind of saying we can get down to 2% even by the end of 2023, early 2024. We think it'll happen by the end of 2024. The Fed thinks sometime in 2025. I think that's feasible. Yes, we will be risking a recession in the process, but if we get one, it would likely be shallower than the average recession. Obviously not desirable, but might be the right trade-off for, for the long run. The goal is for you and I to never really need to have a conversation about inflation, right? So how will we know when we're winning and when policy is working? It's when conversations like this will shift back to to other things.